Okay, so we're going to start our very first lecture um, with chapter one. I recommend that you guys take notes. Um, you read the chapter because you will have a test over all 15 chapters of the textbook. So I will give you weekly lectures um, that are recorded. I will try to keep the lectures as close as possible to 20 minutes, but some of them might be a little bit longer because uh, some of the chapters are longer than others. So if you need to take a break, come back to it later, um, feel free to do so. Chapter one's a little bit longer because it's got information about the history of psychology and then also research methods. If I talk too fast, you have the opportunity to um, slow down and, and rewind. Also, um, there's an option of turning on the captions um, if there's something that I say that you don't understand um, for clarity. So let's go ahead and get started with chapter one. We're going to start by discussing what is psychology. So we need to break down the word psychology, starting with um, psyche, meaning the mind, and logos, the study or knowledge of. So sci psychology is the study of the mind, specifically the scientific study of behavior and mental processes. So let's break down what we mean by behavior and mental processes. So behavior is any overt thing that you can observe and see. So I am observing or measuring how much a person is upset or crying. I could document that if I tried. Mental processes are covert things, things that the naked eye cannot see, things that are going on within a person, things in their thinking, in their remembering, in their mind. Psychology is considered a science. Many people think of psychology as a soft science because we use empirical evidence to test and evaluate assumptions. It's important for you not to um, confuse psychology with what we call pseudo psychologies. These are pseudo meaning false, um, false psychologies that can appear real. Oftentimes students who are interested in psychology or take psychology classes might also be interested in horoscopes or, you know, psychics and things like that. Um, those things are considered pseudo psychologies, things that that can be based on common beliefs or folk wisdom or superstitions that exist for a group of people. So these are all things that are not based on science, but psychology is. When we think in terms of psychology, it's important for you to recognize the nature versus nurture debate. It's a big debate that's been going on in psychology for many years. And that debate is about whether or not genetics or the environment plays more of a role in a person's development. Your nature being your genetics, things that run in your family, and your nurture being your environment, um, things that you grow up around. So which one, just hypothetically think about, which one do you think plays more of a role? Your nature or your nurture? Your genetics or your environment? Maybe it's a little bit of both. There are four goals of psychology to describe, explain, predict, and change behavior and mental processes. So we can describe behaviors by naming and classifying things that we can observe. We can explain those behaviors and mental processes by being able to state the causes of something, we can explain why a person is crying. And then we can use that information to predict um, behaviors that might occur in the future. And then also to change it. So if people are engaging in behaviors or mental processes that are adverse or negative in their lives, we can think of ways to help them move towards more positive attitudes and behaviors. Critical thinking is a skill that's very necessary for you in the psychology class because you have to be able to analyze and evaluate and synthesize information. That is what takes place in psychological research. We want to gather evidence. 
We want to evaluate the effectiveness of the evidence we've gathered, and we want to be able to draw conclusions about what has taken place. So I really want you to think critically about um, some of the situations and some of the ideas that come up in psychology for you um, to do well. One other thing that we need to talk about when it comes to a foundational skill in psychology is what's called a biopsychosocial model. This is a model, a method for us to understand the connection between mental health and physical health. We understand that there are biological, psychological, and social factors that can all impact a person's overall development. We call that the mind-body connection. Were you aware of that connection, that what goes on with you from a psychological perspective can also affect you physically? Let's take a look at the biopsychosocial model. So when I say biological, psychological, and social factors are biopsychosocial, I'm referring to these three factors. What role does your genetics and your physiological health play in your overall development? What role does your sociological or your environmental experiences in your relationships with other people? Do you have social support? Um, what's going on with you from a socioeconomic um, standpoint? Do you have the means to do the things you need to do? And what's going on from a psychological standpoint? What is your mental health? What is your overall emotional health? What are your thoughts and behaviors like? Once all three of those things interact, that makes up the whole person. Now let's talk about some foundational people in the field of psychology, starting with Wilhelm Wundt. He is considered the father of psychology because he was one of the founding people who set up a psychology laboratory to study what he called conscious experiment experiences. He wanted to look at introspection and go inside of a person to figure out, you know, what's going on with their thoughts and feelings. And he did so in um, Germany. One student of Wundt was a man named Edward Titchener. He brought Wundt's ideas to the United States, his ideas of conscious thought and experiences. But he renamed his um, school of thought structuralism because he said, I don't just want to know what's going on with the person from a conscious perspective. I want to know what is the structure of mental life? So he called it structuralism. He wanted to figure out the building blocks of conscious thought. He based that on what he calls sensory experiences. Another founding member in psychology in the United States was William James. William James created his own school of thought as well, known as functionalism. He um, expanded a little bit more on what uh, Vunt and Titchener had done, except he didn't want to look at so much conscious experience. He wanted to look at how the mind functions to help us adapt and survive over time. He was a big proponent of Darwin and the theory of natural selection. So he started to think about, OK, what goes on with us mentally? that helps us adapt and survive in the future throughout the generations. Many people think of William James as the father of American psychology. We also have a number of prominent members in the field of psychology who were women and also people of color. Mary Calkins was um, the first female to earn a PhD in the field of psychology from Harvard University. However, Harvard did not allow women to receive diplomas in um, PhDs at the time, so she was not technically able to be um, acknowledged as the first female recipient of um, a PhD. She became, though, the first female president of the APA, which is the American Psychological Association. That's the governing body over all of the field of psychology. 
A few years later, after Mary Calkins, Margaret Floyd Washburn received the first PhD in psychology, and she became the second female president of the APA. Frances Sumner was the first African American to receive a degree in psychology. And one of his students, uh, Kenneth Clark, became the first African American president of the American Psychological Association. Clark and his wife, Mamie Clark, um, studied prejudice and its impact on society and impact on people as a whole. And Mamie Clark actually played a role in the Brown versus Board of Education decision. Here are some careers and specialties in psychology. Um, so if any of you are interested in becoming a psychologist, there's a table in your textbook that talks a lot more about um, some of the prominent areas in psychology that people work. Um, from being neuroscientists to clinical psychologists, which is the biggest field, forensic psychologists who work in prisons and things like that with the uh, judicial system, health psychologists, many in the hospitals, social psychologists um, dealing with issues that exist in our society, and then also school psychologists. Just to name a few, there are many other fields as well. Now I'd like to talk to us about the seven major perspectives in psychology. These are perspectives that we'll build on as we go throughout the semester, but I'd like to introduce the foundational pieces of those today, starting with the psychodynamic perspective. The psychodynamic perspective focuses on what's going on with a person that's outside their conscious awareness. These are unconscious things that exist within a person that impact their overall functioning. The behavioral perspective focuses on specific behaviors, a stimulus, something that occurs, and a response. How do people behave? The humanistic perspective focuses on free will, and reaching one's full potential and being growth seeking, becoming the best version of yourself. The cognitive perspective focuses on the mental process that can exist within a person. So it's not interested at all in what a person does, but how a person thinks and processes a situation. The biological perspective, focuses on how a person's genetics and their overall physical health impacts their development and their psychological functioning. The evolutionary perspective focuses on natural selection and what has helped people survive and adapt and reproduce, reproduce over a period of time. And lastly, we have the social cultural perspective, which focuses on the social interactions and dynamics that exist between people um, from various cultures. Now let's talk about research. And um, this is kind of the second part of chapter one. Now that we've talked about some foundational pieces of how psychology started, now we're gonna talk about what truly makes psychology a science. This would be a good place if you're uh, feeling a little tired to take a break and um, start back up in just a second. So there are two types of research in psychology. There's applied research and there's basic research. Applied research is research that we can use. We can apply it to other aspects of society. It's practical. Anytime there's research on a drug or um, something that will help people as a whole, that is applied research. Basic research is everything else that's going to explore a question, something that might be interesting to us, but it may not be something we can apply to society as a whole. For example, it might be interesting to look at whether or not people change their kissing habits as they age, but that's not going to be something that's going to necessarily have an impact on all of society. It's interesting to think about, but doesn't have that much of an impact on society as a whole. So there are three broad categories of psychological research. 
Oops. Sorry about that. There's descriptive research, research, and experimental research. We're going to look at all three in a little more detail. So descriptive research has the purpose of observing and recording behavior. Nothing is manipulated or changed in using descriptive research, and there are three types. You could have a case study, a survey, or a naturalistic observation. So a survey is the cheapest, fastest, most common type of study in the field of psychology. Some of you may have participated in some psychological research using surveys. And the reason um, it is highly used and very common is because it's easy to do, it's fast, and you can get a good sample of people. You can get thousands of people to complete a survey and get good information. Naturalistic observation has to do with watching people in their natural environment without them knowing. So nothing is manipulated and um, there's not what we call the Hawthorne effect, which is when people change their behavior based on knowing they're part of an experiment that doesn't take place with naturalistic observation. Because if a person is participating in a naturalistic observation, they don't know that they're being observed. And because of that, we can't really show cause and effect. We don't know anything else that's taking place. A good example of naturalistic observation might be um, studying the dynamics between parents and their children um, by observing them in a park and looking at whether or not parents positively and negatively um, reinforce or punish their children. So you would, you would be able to document what's taking place through naturalistic observation, but you wouldn't know anything else related to the situation. And then our last type of descriptive research is a case study. And that's when you take a detailed picture, a detailed look at one person or a group of people to find more information about them. We're going to talk about one case study um, next chapter in chapter two for a man named Phineas Gage, um, who had a metal rod go through his brain. It went in and out of his brain. And he was a subject of a case study because of his unique situation. Um, it was important to know how he could function and how long he would survive after having a metal rod go through his head. But even though that's interesting, it's not something that we can apply to the rest of society. It tells us about one person's experience. The second type of research methods is correlational research. Correlational research tells us about relationships, naturally occurring relationships that exist between two variables. There's also nothing manipulated in correlational research. One statement that you have to realize when you think of correlational research, so you're exploring a relationship that exists between two variables, is the fact that correlation does not prove or equal causation. So just because two things have a relationship between each other, or just because two things are related to each other, doesn't mean one thing causes another thing. For example, let's just say it's National Ice Cream Day at Dairy Queen, and you know everyone gets a free ice cream cone. And let's also say that on the news, we notice that there's an uptick, there's an increase of murders in society. Can we say that eating ice cream causes people to commit murder or um, murder causes people to eat ice cream? No, of course we cannot say that there's a cause and effect relationship, but perhaps we could say that there's a correlation between consuming sugar and aggressive behavior. Maybe there's a relationship between those two things, but we cannot say that just because a person eats ice cream, they're going to commit murder. And we also need to, when we think of correlational research, think about the types of correlations that can exist. There could be a positive correlation, which is when the variables, the two things that are being looked at, go in the same direction such as when you study more 
when there's an increase in setting, hopefully there's also an increase in grades. So if you look at the chart, the increase in studying leads to an increase in grades. Those two variables go in the same direction in an upward position. A negative correlation occurs when the two variables go in opposite directions. For example, if there's an increase in drug use, there's probably going to be a decrease in grades. So one variable goes increase, the other one goes decrease, and it goes in a downward position as you see on the chart. And then there's also the possibility of no correlation when there's no direction on the different variables. The third type of research is experimental research. This is the main part of psychological research because it explores a cause and effect relationship. There, it, there are things that are manipulated. Um, we try to eliminate things that could negatively impact a study and include random assignment. So let's talk about some of the things associated with experimental research. So first off, with experimental research, we want to establish a cause and effect relationship. We want to be able to say by conducting a research that one thing causes another thing to occur. We do so by having two or more groups of people participate in experimental research. We try to make sure that the people who are participating in the research study are all alike in as many ways as we can. And we try to eliminate ways that they might be different. And we record that information. With experimental research, we also have a hypothesis. So that means that we've got to have an idea of something that's going to occur. We're going to try to establish a relationship between two variables. We've got to be able to test whether or not the hypothesis we have or we're stating is correct. A variable in experimental research is anything that can vary or change between participants in research. Um, for example, if we say that if you participate in class, you'll get better grades, um, we can look at those two groups of people, people who participate in class and people who don't participate in class to see if there's a difference. There are two different types of variables we can have in experimental research, and that is an independent variable and a dependent variable. So remember, a var variable is anything that can change or vary between participants. So our independent variable is the thing that's being manipulated by the experimenter. It's the thing that the experimenter wants to know whether or not it works. For example, if it's a drug, um, we're trying to see if that drug is effective. Like if we wanted to see whether Tylenol reduces headaches, Tylenol would be our independent variable. Our dependent variable is what's being measured. It's what depends on the independent variable. So if we want to see whether that Tylenol reduces headaches, Tylenol would be our independent variable because that's what's being administered. And we're trying to see whether or not it reduces headaches. So that would be our dependent variable. Same way with the COVID-19 vaccine. There were a group of people who participated in the study who received the vaccine, the independent variable, and whether or not to see if that would cause a decrease in symptoms or eliminate the possibility of symptoms. And that would be the dependent variable. There are also two groups that participate in experiments. There's the experimental group, the group that's giving the independent variable. They're given the drug like the Tylenol or the vaccine. And there's a control group who's not exposed to the independent variable. They're actually given a placebo, which is like a sugar pill that has no effect. We have to have two groups one who receives the drug and one who does not receive the drug so that we will know if the drug actually worked. Now, from an ethical perspective, if we do discover the drug works, we then have to also give um, the people who did not receive the drug 
um, the opportunity to get it later um, if it was something that worked. For example, those people who participated in um, COVID-19 vaccine trials, um, anybody who was in the control group was later given the vaccine before anybody else because that's the ethical thing to do. Whenever conducting an experiment, it's important to try to control for what we call extraneous variables. Those are other things that can exist in people just because they're natural people that could impact the study. For example, it could be a person's lifestyle. It could be the number of hours they sleep. It could be their family dynamics, anything that could impact the study. So if I wanted to study whether or not smoking causes heart issues, there might be other extraneous or con confounding variables that could affect my study. For example, it could be genetics. It could be lifestyle. If people don't eat healthy, they could also have heart issues. If there have been heart issues um, that exist in a family, those things, that could be a reason why that occurs. And I can't just say it's smoking. So it's important to try to control for those things, but sometimes we can't. One of the ways or two of the ways we try to minimize those extraneous or confounding variables is by using random sampling and random assignment. Random sampling has to do with giving every person in the population an equal chance at being chosen to participate in the study. So that means if I want to study um, whether or not college students are happy, I would need to give every college student in the world an opportunity at participating in my research study. And I would do that by offering everybody an opportunity to participate to get a good sample. Some people are going to tell me yes, some people are going to say no. Once I've got my sample of people to participate, I then randomly assign them to the experimental or the control group because I want to give everyone an equal chance at being a part of either group. One other way to try to control for extraneous variables is to have a single blind or double blind study. A single blind study occurs when the experimenter doesn't know who's getting a placebo and who's getting the experimental drug. A double blind experiment has to do with the participant and the experimenter not knowing who's given the placebo and who's actually given the treatment. A double blind procedure is best because then nobody knows what's taking place, um, but a single blind um, can also be important because we never want the participant to know if they have the real treatment or if they are getting a placebo. So anytime a research study is conducted, it's important to make sure that ethical guidelines are followed. One of which is the ethical guidelines for animal research. Now animals provide a basis for a lot of research, especially if it would be inhumane to um, provide a certain um, treatment to adult to adults or to people. But when it comes to animal research, there must be a clear purpose. Animals must be treated in humane ways. They must be acquired legally. And if there's any suffering that could possibly take place, it must be the least amount of suffering possible. Those are the guidelines for animal research. For human research, we have other guidelines. And I always tell students to remember the mnemonic uh, Peter Piper cried when Charles Darwin died um, because um, there are seven different ethical guidelines for human research. Humans must be protected from harm. Um, they must um, have their privacy maintained. They must give informed consent and agree to participate in the study. They must um, be allowed to withdraw from the study or to leave at any point, even if it's in the middle. They must have their confidentiality maintained. You can't go talking about a person who participates in the study. 
Um, deception cannot be used. They cannot be lied to. And lastly, at the end of the study, uh, all participants must be debriefed and told um, what they just participated in. And that is um, everything to do with research. The last couple of things I want to talk about in chapter one are some strategies for success as a student. In order to be a successful student, you have to improve your study habits, um, engage in active reading, make sure that you guys um, highlight, reread information, you take notes over the lectures, and also improve your time management. So, you know, this is a class where, you know, it's only eight weeks and all of your assignments are due on a weekly basis. So you have to establish a timeline for when you're going to actually listen to the lectures, when you're going to read your textbook, and when you're going to take your tests so that you're able to complete everything in a timely manner. You can reward yourself whenever you finish the chapter and done everything that you needed to do, but you have to be able to maximize your time. And I'm sure you guys have had those experiences um, in other classes as well. One way that you could study is to use a method called the SQR4R um, uh, R method, the SQR4 method, which has to do with surveying, looking at the chapter information first. That's the S. Number two, to question, um, to make questions about some of those chapter headings you see as you're surveying the chapter. Then as you, number three, the first R is to read um, the information and write down as much as you can. Um, that's the second R is to write down the information, kind of summarize as you're going. Number five, to review the information, to kind of test yourself over it and to recite it. But you should be able to speak and say the information that you've learned. So the SQR4 method is one way to study, and that might be a, an effective method for you to use to study for psychology. And that is everything you need to know for chapter one.